Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, yet shall they live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. For I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore. And because I live, you shall live also. Friends, we've gathered here to praise God and to witness to our faith as we celebrate the life of William Enright. We come together in grief, acknowledging our human loss, but may God grant us grace that in pain we may find comfort, in sorrow hope, and in death resurrection. Amen. Let us pray. Eternal God, we praise you for the great company of all those who finished their course in faith and now rest from their labor. We praise you for those dear to us whom we name in our hearts before you. Especially we praise you for William, whom you have graciously received into your presence. To all these grant your peace. Let perpetual light shine upon them and help us so to believe where we have not seen that your presence may lead us through our years and bring us at last with them into the joy of your home, not made with hands, but eternal in the heavens. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We will open our service this afternoon with the singing uh, hymn number 378, Amazing Grace, verses 1, 2, 4, and 6. Would you please stand? seated. The Old Testament lessons will be read by 
uh, Judge Enright's daughters, Carrie and Kimberly. Twenty-third Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Psalm 121. I lift up mine eyes into the hills, from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not smite you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep you, your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Father's way. 
troubles gain No more fret nor pain No more stumbling on the way No more longing for the day Going to Rome no The New Testament lessons are taken from the Gospel of John and the second letter to Timothy. Jesus said, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I'm going. I will not leave you orphaned. I'm coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. I have said these things to you while I am still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives, so do not let your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. And then Bill chose the second lesson from the New Testament, and he limited it to one verse from Paul's second letter to Timothy. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith.
We're gathered here to give thanks to God for the gift of the life of Bill Enright. My acquaintance with him was primarily through the San Diego Rotary Club, where both of us were members. And I will always remember his warm and energetic greetings when we met. He made you feel important when he met you. I was also impressed that he left specific instructions for this service, including the scripture passages. And I found them to be a meaningful selection and would have loved to have discussed with him why he chose them and what they meant to him. The 23rd Psalm is traditionally read at funerals and so is his second choice, the 121st Psalm. But I suspect that there is another reason that he chose them. And I speculated on that. Because both are called pilgrim psalms. They were recited by Jewish pilgrims traveling to Jerusalem for one of the seasonal feasts in the temple. But like all scripture and all great literature, which arises from ordinary human circumstances, there's a reason that they acquire a transcendent meaning. And when they are no longer read as the record of an historical event, but now have a universal appeal, a sacred meaning. And these Psalms not only spoke to ancient pilgrims on their way to Jerusalem, but they speak to all of us with their message that life is understood as a journey and there are times or seasons on that journey when it's like dwelling in green pastures beside still waters. In other words, the happy times of our lives. But there are other moments when life is like walking through dark valleys where the shadow of death confronts us with our own finite natures. That's the imagery of the 23rd Psalm. It includes both seasons of life, the happy seasons and the sad seasons, the tragic seasons, the easy times, and the hard times. In order to proclaim that through all the seasons of our lives, we are led, we're guided as pilgrims by a providence not of our making, a transcendent power over our lives. Bill also chose the 121st Psalm, another pilgrim song that transcends its origin in ancient Israel to speak to every generation in every age. And it begins, I lift my eyes to the hills. That's a reference to where the local gods dwelt, the false gods. And then the psalmist asks a rhetorical question. Well, where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. And in the end, the 20, 121st Psalm's message is the same as the 23rd's. The Lord is my shepherd through this life. Only it uses different pilgrim metaphors. And 121st Psalm says, the Lord is like my shade protecting me from the all-consuming heat of the desert sun. And ends by saying, the Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your coming out and your going in from this time forth and forevermore. Now those affirmations of faith are what Bill chose to be read this afternoon. And we can be certain that they spoke to his consciousness of himself being a pilgrim on a journey. And that's the same as saying, that life has a purpose and a goal. So the fulfilled life is a goal-oriented life, and you live it as a pilgrim, a life that keeps moving towards something beyond myself. And as you all know, that described the life of Bill Enright. I noticed that in the comments that some wrote about him, they pointed out that he was a member of the greatest generation. That's a term that was coined by Tom Brokaw in a book by the same title written in the 90s. It's a marvelous book about the generation that was born in the 1920s 
grew up in the 30s during the Depression and in the 40s fought in the Second World War. Those years were a time of deprivation and sacrifice in this country. And the result of such a time was a generation with a commitment to living with integrity and purpose and humility and with an expectation that a successful life requires hard work and self-sacrifice. So the message of the greatest generation is that a successful life is not about riches and security, but it is about giving yourself to something greater than yourself, which is also the message of the pilgrim psalms that he chose. Life includes struggle and sacrifice and hard work in order to achieve the promise. I can't help but believe that the problems we face today as a nation are due in large part to the obvious fact that we've forgotten the wisdom and the character that guided the greatest generation. The division and mistrust that have become common in our daily lives threatens the dream of America. And that dream is that people of all different races and cultures and classes and religions and genders can form a union where all are respected and all free to find their fulfillment as human beings. But achieving that, we're learning this, is hard work. But the greatest generation was raised on that creed that a worthwhile life requires hard work and they possess the moral strength to make the sacrifices to achieve it, not just for themselves, but for everyone else. And Bill Enright gave his life to that goal. He chose one more text to be read at this service, and it's from Paul's second letter to Timothy. Paul writes this, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. That's the one verse Bill selected, and it's sufficient in itself as a testimony to a fulfill, faithful life. But I want to add this. The metaphor, I have finished the race, that Paul uses in this letter to Timothy is from the ancient Greek Olympic Games, where the victor receives a wreath. So Paul writes, I have fought the good fight. I finished the race, I have kept the faith. And then this, henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord will award to me on that day. That's an affirmation of the Christian faith that our lives will continue after this one. It's the faith that is embodied in the poetry that the family selected to be printed in this order of service this afternoon. And it's in the passage I read to you from the Gospel of John. The setting of that passage is the Last Supper with the disciples the night before he is arrested. And Jesus says to his disciples and to all of us, in my Father's house are many dwelling places and I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am, you may be also. Amen.
And now we will hear words of tribute for Bill Enright uh, by his uh, colleagues and friends and family. And first we will hear from the Honorable Jeffrey Miller. Good afternoon, everyone. Perhaps Shakespeare said it the best, as he usually did. His life was gentle, and the elements in him so mixed that nature might stand up to the world and say, this was a man. To his colleagues, he was the heart and soul and voice of our court. He was our navigational star a judge of great intellect and humanity. While it is true, as Judge Barry Moskowitz said, Judge Enright's passing is the end of an era, just listen to the words of Judge Enright's colleagues as they speak to the immortality of his influence. For Judge Dana Sabraw, Judge Enright had the voice of God and was quite frankly the most revered judge in the history of San Diego. For Judge Anthony Battaglia, the judge had a demeanor and a manner I have tried to emulate. There will never be another like him. I just strive to get close. Judge Marilyn Huff, who succeeded Judge Enright's particular office, has a special place in her heart for him and notes how tirelessly he worked for civility, professionalism, and ethics, how he dedicated himself to those principles and purposes his entire professional life. And of course, Judge Enright's lasting influence will be reflected in the William B. Enright Inn of Court for a long, long time. All that we cherish of our country and our legal profession reposed in this man of transcendent stature. He possessed, in addition, a kindness and a chivalry and a classical devotion to honor and duty and service, regardless of whether he was enlisting in the United States Navy at the age of 17 during World War II and coming out, as he put it, 37 months later as a man, or whether as a universal ambassador for our profession and our branch of government. I was thinking this morning of all the lives he must have touched in his almost 70 years in the legal profession, the thousands of lawyers, the tens of thousands of jurors, and before every single one of them, he enhanced the image of our profession and the courts. You know, he and I talked a few times about David Brooks, a journalist, an author. Some of you may be familiar with him. He was very fond of David Brooks, uh, as am I. David Brooks wrote something one time that stuck with me. He said, there are some who are born into this world with a sense of indebtedness for the blessing of being alive and a sense of moral responsibility to serve others and the institutions we venerate. Bill Enright was such a man, and the immortality of his influence exists in the very marrow of our court. We, not, we may not be aware of it on a constant and conscious basis, but it is there. Judge Enright hasn't left us, but Bill Enright, our friend, has, and it is so hard to find the words to do any justice to the gift of friendship that he made all of us feel. Bill was everyone's friend. He made us feel like family and that we had a special relationship with him. He never missed an opportunity to give praise or to share a story. Every one of his colleagues felt they had a special relationship with him. The thing was, for a man so charismatic, and he was the most charismatic individual I ever met personally in my life, he was affable, relatable, approachable, 
there was just this special quality that he had. There was a magic to the way he related to people. I used to love to walk to our Monday judges meetings with him. He'd enter that room and he was greeted like a rock star, which he was. And then there are the little ironies uh, in, in Bill's life. Bill, for example, could not get over the fact that his father had died at the age of 41 when Bill, uh, Bill was 12. And that Bill was living such a robust life through his 80s and into his 90s. The real irony was that Bill, who had lost his father at 12, became a father to so many of us. And if not a father, an older brother, a guide, a mentor, a standard. And so uh, his, one, his one lament, and he began to voice this uh, uh, almost every week as we were walking to the meetings and as I was spending quiet time with him in chambers was, oh, to be 85 again. That's all he was asking for, oh, to be 85 again. And what that meant to him was that he could get back to his gym workouts because he really missed his gym workouts, which he gave up uh, probably in his late 80s or about 90. So one day we were walking uh, leaving a meeting, went down, and as all the judges know, we passed the fitness room, uh, walking back to the Schwartz uh, uh, courthouse. And there was the fitness room in all its glory. There wasn't a soul inside. We had these big glass windows. And beyond the windows uh, were all the machines, the equipment, and then free weights beyond that. And Bill just walked up to the windows and looked through them longingly, and at that point, neither one of us, well, we could resist anything but temptation. I'll put it that way. And so uh, I said, Bill, come with me. And so we got into the room. We got to the back where the weights were. And uh, I got a five-pounder, a 10-pounder off one of the racks. I put it in his hand. And I said, go for it. And he started with the curls going back and forth. And just, just out of, I don't know, out of respect, I sort of averted my eyes. And he was uh, working with, uh, with both hands. And then it, it hit me that, that here I was standing watch for my personal item, idol, excuse me, as, as, as he was busting curls, pumping iron at the gym of the courthouse. It's a moment that I will, I will never forget. Um, another irony was, was Bill's um, rich embrace of stoicism as a philosophy student at Dartmouth University and then later on in life. He was pretty consistent with that. Uh, even though Stoicism holds that the wise man should be free from passion and unmoved by joy or grief, Bill was one of the most passionate people I had ever met in life about the things he cared about, about the people he cared about and loved, about his court. And uh, of course, I'll never forget uh, the way he used to almost sing and dance as he came to work down the back hallways on floors four and five. He would hum and he would, um, he would actually sing. Uh, he would uh, stick his head in every open door as he was leaving the courthouse and tell people, you're doing a great job. Keep up the good work. Spread that sunshine. And uh, it, was, it was just a wonderful thing to behold. I don't know what the founders of Stoicism would have thought about that in terms of reluctance to share joy and grief, but, but that, was, that was Bill through and through. Uh, when we dedicated uh, the Enright Conference Room, we got him by surprise. He knew something was up, but he walked in uh, to thunderous applause. And as soon as he walked in, he started, he started with the hands, no, 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 and averting his, averting his eyes. Whatever it is, I don't deserve it. I don't deserve it, showing that kind of humility in the face of our effort to, uh, to uh, acknowledge him in that way. Uh, he did deserve it, and so much more, uh, from the, the major battles of a world war to the gloaming of a brilliant career. He deserved every tribute and honor that he ever received. We, uh, Bill Enright's colleagues, loved him. Uh, we respected him. We admired him and we're thankful for his legacy. Uh, Sophocles talking, writing about uh, life a couple of thousand years ago said, one must wait until the evening to see how splendid the day has been. 
in light of all that Bill was able to see and hear and know and experience, including the love of friends and colleagues, when evening did arrive, he could look back and say, the day has indeed been splendid. Again, Shakespeare, we shall never see his like again. May I ask Milt Silverman to join me up here? Thank you, Milt. Thank you, sir. Bill Enright planned everything, including his own funeral. A few years ago, I'd say between five and ten years ago, when he was in perfectly good health, I think he was a senior judge at the time, because I used to visit him in his smaller chambers, he called me on the phone at my office. And usually when he called me, he wanted something. And of course, I always said yes. This time his voice sounded a little tentative, like he was afraid I might say no. And he asked very solemnly, Milt, will you speak at my funeral? And I said, of course, it would be my great honor. So the time eventually came when I would have the opportunity to fulfill that promise. And I can't say that I really had a good idea of what it was going to be. As I was mulling through my mind the last few weeks, what was I going to say? I, I kept coming back to one question. Why did he ask me? I was not a famous judge. I was not a professional colleague. I was not a blood relative. Um, I, I had a relationship with him which was pretty much arm's length and professional. I did eat lunch with him almost every month, but it was part of the luncheon meeting every month of the American College of Trial Lawyers, which he usually chaired, and we'd have 10 to 15 there. Uh, mostly trial lawyers, uh, a few judges, Larry Burns um, and uh, Dick Huffman, for example, who had been great trial lawyers before their legal career. But I didn't really talk to him much there. I talked to him uh, elsewhere. And I came to the conclusion that the reason he asked me to speak was not because he wanted me to speak. He did not want a speaker. He wanted a witness. This is a church, and in church, Beginning with the first ones, the first Christians were Jews that gathered in church houses. To this very day, there has been the idea in houses like this, small or large, of someone like a church leader saying, 
can I get a witness? And someone stands up and says, I am a witness. I will testify. So Bill chose me to testify. He chose me to be his witness. And this is my testimony. I first saw him in person on a country road on the east side of Mount Helix overlooking El Cajon. I had a young man walking beside me. I don't remember his name. He was probably between 15 and 18. And I saw Bill Enright coming down Sierra Vista Drive, walking toward me with a young man beside him who I did not know and, and to this day cannot identify. As we got closer, I realized that the two youngsters knew each other and they greeted each other. And I turned and looked at Bill. Now, let me tell you, I had just arrived uh, in California uh, after serving my first year as a Reggie Fellow at Pueblo County Legal Services in Pueblo, Colorado. And I was um, in my Colorado dress. I had long hair, big bushy beard, cowboy hat, uh, what we call a buffalo coat, which was actually not buffalo, but it was suede with a, a Indian embroidery on it, and cowboy boots, a big wide uh, belt, and a big buckle. In other words, I did not look like an ordinary San Diegan. And Bill was warmly dressed because it was cold, I remember that. And I knew exactly who he was. He was a famous criminal defense lawyer. He was in this community, all years told, 18 years as a criminal defense trial lawyer. And the one thing I aspired to more than anything else was being that. And I knew exactly who he was because I had studied all the great trial lawyers locally and nationally. And I'd read books about them. And I had watched a many hours video put on by the San Diego County Bar of a mock trial between Bill Enright, serving as defense counsel, and Bill Kennedy, a famous prosecutor, putting on a full-blown case. So I knew exactly who he was. And the young boys turned and started to introduce us and after his name was said, I asked a question to which I knew the answer. I said, are you a lawyer? And he said, yes, I am. And without stopping, I said, so am I. And his face lit up. He got a big smile on his face. He extended his hand. He greeted me with the warmest greeting you can imagine. Welcome to the bar. It was such a surprise to me that someone who was so utterly famous was talking to an absolute nobody and that he would do something other than pat me on the head and say, okay, kid, good luck, but that he would greet me like uh, exuberantly. And um, so I talked to him briefly there. And from this chance encounter, well, I, as you know, 
or some of you know, I can be a little bit ambitious, so I was, uh, I took advantage of this. Um, I called him up at times and uh, I'd say, can I come see you? Can I visit with you? Sure, come on over. This continued even after he became a federal judge. And we used to talk about all kinds of things. And, um, and he later, I heard him publicly comment once that I was the only person that ever did that in all of his years. He never had somebody call up and say, can I come over and talk to you? Um, one of the things that I talked to him about was often it was ethical issues. At the time, I was a very aggressive defense lawyer, and I took investigation very seriously, and this sometimes resulted in me finding stuff that the cops had overlooked, so I had questions about what duty I had, if any, to tip the cops off about what they had overlooked. Uh, which ultimately in 1977 in the, in the triple murder case that I defended of Susan Driscoll, you know, they, uh, they left everything important there, and, um, which was writings, and, uh, you know, wound up coming through my office with a search warrant. And uh, later the Supreme Court issued a ruling that explained how that was to be handled. Um, The first thing I can remember him, this was about 15 years into our relationship, uh, was one day he called and, and asked me, he, he explained to me that Warren Berger, the Chief Justice, had established something called uh, the American Inn of Court, and uh, he wanted me to become, I don't know what you call it, a charter member or, or whatever, and would I would I join it? And I did, and I, it was, I was there for 20 years, and it was a marvelous experience. Uh, and this is something that he started, he planted here, because one of his great passions was teaching young trial lawyers. And that's what the American Inn of Court was all about. Um, he, um, he, he uh, also called me when we put on the second annual meeting of the American Inn of Court at Hotel Coronado. He arranged and directed all of that. Uh, it was called the Bones of Colonel Hart. And uh, I had uh, uh, Bonnie Redding do the direct and Jerry McMahon and I did different kinds of cross-examinations, and the guy I chose for an expert witness was Dan Broderick, who, of course, was not only a lawyer, but a medical doctor. Um, I am told that uh, that is still being shown to this day, and that's something that Bill Enright caused. So that gives you a little insight into his commitment to educating young lawyers. There have been some biblical passages quoted. When I think of Bill, I think of, of one from the Hebrew prophet Micah. What does the Lord your God require of you but to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. I swear, I testify that Bill Enright did justice throughout his entire life. I testify that he was a man of compassion and understanding. One time after he was on the bench, he <clears throat> told me that when he sentenced someone to probation, he would pull a key out of his pocket and say, I'm granting you probation, but 
the key to your freedom is in your hands. Take this key and keep it with you. And remember that you have the key to your own freedom. And he was humble. He had humility. He was not puffed up. He did not lord it over people. He was a person that dealt with you as a, another human being. He was very committed to expanding the opportunities for women and minorities and uh, other overlooked uh, groups uh, to have an active role and participation and leadership in the uh, bar, in the bar, especially the trial bar. And when I became the president of the Criminal Defense Lawyers Club, one of the first things I did was I said, we have to increase the uh, number of women and minorities uh, into the uh, Criminal Defense Lawyers Club. And that was directly the result of the influence of uh, Bill Enright. He was a man of great integrity. I had in my wall, on my wall, in my office, in a little hallway corner, three pictures. One of a famous trial lawyer who I greatly admired, and two uh, of judges, uh, one of whom had been also a great trial lawyer before he became a judge. And there weren't any, I, it was just there, they had all written something there. And I called Bill up and I told him about it and I asked him if he would, um, if he would um, give me a picture and sign it. And he said, I'll get back to you. And a few days later, he called me back. He said, okay, I, I have the picture. I want to come up and see you. And I said, Bill, come on. You're a busy guy. I'll go to you. He says, no, no, no. I want to come to you. So he did. He arrived in the back of the Quartermass Wild House. And uh, we went in the back, which was basically a uh, war room with, you know, metal chairs and things like that, nothing fancy. He sat across from me and he said, I have the picture, but I didn't sign it. And I want to tell you why. I wanted to make sure that it was proper for me to sign it. So he explained that there's some ethics number you can call if you're a judge a federal judge, and you can say, hey, is this, is this cool or is this not cool? And they told him, well, he told me. He said, they advised me not to sign it because it might be interpreted as an endorsement. So I'm not going to sign it. And then he got real serious, and he looked at me real close, and he said, but let me tell you, if I could, what I would say. And he did so for, for a considerable amount of time with great sincerity. He told me what he thought of me. And I, I took that picture and I put it there on that wall, and I was, it was so meaningful to me that it wasn't signed. So what does this tell you? What am I testifying to about Bill Enright? I have a single line from a psalm written by King David, who was said to be a man after God's own heart. And he said, 
I have walked in my integrity on the road called truth. And so I see him, I see Bill Enright now as I saw him the first time I met him. He is not walking toward me. I do not see him face to face, but he is on a road and he has passed by and I am watching him as he walks away. Walks away in his integrity on a road called truth, beckoning others to follow. Now we will hear from Judge Joan Weber. I'm so happy we can finally all be together to remember, honor, and celebrate this man's life. He will always be our gold standard in this town for civility, intelligence, professionalism, and his absolute devotion to this profession that we have all chosen. When my good friend Kevin asked me to speak today, I wanted my remarks to emphasize how Judge Enright mentored and inspired so many young lawyers in this community, like myself. I first met this man in 1983 when I became an assistant U.S. attorney. I was assigned to his courtroom as the duty AUSA. That meant that every routine criminal case filed in his courtroom, I was going to be the prosecutor. So I tried my first 10 to 12 jury trials in front of this legal legend. You can imagine how scary it was to be in his presence with that voice that sounded like it was coming from the heavens. But pretty early on, I realized I was the luckiest person in the entire federal courthouse. It turned out he became my mentor, my idol, and frankly, the inspiration for almost everything I've done in my professional career. First off, in his courtroom, he had to get used to all of his pet phrases. I called these his Enrightisms. You were going to hear these in every single trial. Ms. Weber, you have the laboring oar on that issue. Don't gild the lily, Ms. Weber. Prune the trees, Ms. Weber. And if he used, along with those phrases, the classic Judge Enright pulling the hair back, and I know many of you know this, you knew you were really in trouble. You better watch out. But you know what? He was the most brilliant trial judge I have ever seen. He knew the evidence code like the back of his hand, and he treated every single person in that courtroom with dignity and decency, and that included the criminal defendant. Milt gave an example of uh, what he said at probation. Um, I'll go a little further with that speech. He tell the defendant, I'm giving you probation, and I'm giving you this key 
to your freedom. This young lady, referring to the court reporter, is taking down every word I am saying to you right now. And if you violate one of these terms and conditions, you and I will have nothing to say to each other. You are going to prison. I know I see a lot of my former colleagues here, and you all remember that speech. I called it the Enright Lecture. I was terrified every time I heard the Enright Lecture, and I was the prosecutor. <laughs> but if you think about it, here was a judge who truly wanted this defendant to succeed. So he took the time to speak directly to him, look at him in the eyes, and tell him, impress upon him, that he held the key to his own freedom. After each trial, he would encourage me and the criminal defense lawyer to make an appointment with his secretary, Penny. It took me several weeks to get up the nerve to make the appointment, but I am so glad I did. He had this big green trial notebook, and he took copious notes throughout the trial. And you'd go up there, and he would critique every part of your trial performance. It was like having Clarence Darrow give you advocacy lessons. And the mentoring went way beyond just telling you how to try a case. He'd always be there to give you professional advice. He encouraged me to become a judge, and he is the reason I put in my application. And you would think the mentoring would end once I became a judge. Oh, no. Throughout my judicial career, he would write me these beautiful, handwritten notes any time I presided over a particularly difficult case, or I got a promotion, or uh, if I got some special award. You want to know when the last time I received a letter like that? It was in 2015. I had been a trial judge for over 25 years. Bill Enright was 90 years old in 2015. And yet this incredible man took the time to handwrite me a beautiful note congratulating me. You just can't imagine what his encouragement and guidance meant to me and so many other young lawyers. I asked several of my contemporaries, several of them I see here today, to give me their thoughts on Judge Enright's impact on them as young attorneys. And according to Kevin, Judge Enright was very fond of all three of these folks. First, Magistrate Judge Karen Crawford. She says, as a young AUSA, I had the good fortune to appear in front of Judge Enright many times. He was everything a superb judge could be. But it was off the bench that he had the most profound impact on my life. When I went to see him to tell him I was getting married and moving to a city that had no inns of court chapters, he urged me to start one. Of course, I could never say no to him. So that is exactly what I did. And my involvement with the Inns grew over time, and so did my gratitude for him for having the confidence in me to undertake this important goal. Karen is still, as we all know, a leader in the Inns movement. Second, I spoke with criminal defense lawyer Judy Clark, and she says, whether I appreciated it at the time or not. Judge Enright taught me that the court wasn't there to make my job easier, that I had to be prepared and I needed to know the law as well or better than the judge and learn to effectively tell my client's story. And as we all know, Judy really has been an effective person in telling her client's stories. Finally, Patrick O'Toole, longtime AUSA and Deputy DA. 
And Pat says, for me, as a young AUSA, Judge Enright was both intimidating and inspiring. His presence invoked both. We've been blessed with excellent judges in our district, but there was only one of whom God said, let there be a judge, and that was Judge Enright. He personified what it is to be a judge. We won't look upon his like again. Well said, Pat. So how do we ensure that this great man's legacy lives on? By listening to his words and allowing them to guide us in our everyday professional careers. He would constantly say, guard your reputation. You only get one and you won't get another. Probably the single most important rule for a young lawyer to remember. And he lived this principle in everything he said and did. The next time you step to the podium or you put on that black robe, think of his words and make him proud. He also frequently said, be proud of your profession. Lawyers wrote the Bill of Rights, the Constitution, and the Declaration of Independence. We've contributed remarkably to the social fabric of this great democracy. Follow his lead by joining an in, getting involved in bar activities. He was the president of our county bar. And donating time to educate the community on the wonderful things that lawyers and judges do in this town. Finally, whenever I preside over a jury trial, I can hear him saying this one. If you believe in democracy, a jury is democracy in a microcosm. How prescient he was on this one. He dies on March 7, 2020, and one week later, America is in lockdown. The courts all across this great nation were closed. I don't know about you, but that pandemic tragedy really got me thinking of the importance of the jury trial in our system. There's lots of talk about a post-pandemic America where we force more cases into mediation, uh, we try to limit live testimony, and a lot of talk about actually taking away jury trials in complex civil. If we all want to keep Judge Enright's legacy alive, let's all join the fight to preserve our jury trial system. So as we think about this great man today, let's remember what he fought for and believed for the entire 50 years of his distinguished career as a lawyer and judge. And to Judge Enright's family, his wife of 68 years, Betty, who's now deceased. His children, Kevin, Carrie, and Kimberly. Kevin's wife, Judy. Bill's beloved eight grandchildren that he just adored. And his extended family here today. Even in your grief, I hope that you can take solace in knowing that your father and grandfather changed this legal community in profound and long-lasting ways. Thank you for sharing him with all of us for the last half century. And to my mentor and idol, Judge William B. Enright, you can't begin to imagine how much we all miss you. May you rest in peace, Your Honor. Thank you, Reverend Frauder. Uh, this is overwhelming. Um, on behalf 
of our family, I want to thank you all for coming. You honor my father by your presence. Our family is deeply appreciative. I thank Reverend Trotter. I thank Judge Jeff Miller. I thank Milt Silverman. I thank Judge Joan Weber. Truly overwhelming and um, so moving. They all speak from the heart. We are all grateful for the words and thoughts you have expressed. I'll be as brief as my heart will allow. As you heard, dad lost his father when he was 12. Growing up in a tough Irish neighborhood in Queens, he learned to fend for himself at a young age. He developed into a force of nature, a man of uncommon character and grace, a man of integrity, a devoted husband and father. His honesty, intellect, and tenacity are what made him the fine trial lawyer he was. Dad could move people's hearts and souls. He told us, quote, let the lions come, end quote. The trials and tribulations of life were a character builder for Dad. That which didn't kill him just made him stronger. Teddy Roosevelt, the man in the arena, he viewed trial as the last arena. John Milton wrote, let her truth and falsehood grapple. Who would ever know, whoever knew truth put to the worst in a free and open encounter? Smooth seas never made a skilled navigator. Dad married the love of his life, our mother, Betty, in 1951. Unconditional love was showered on my sisters, Kim, Carrie, and me. We knew that. We felt that. Mom and Dad were devoted to us, always positive, always supportive, no matter what the situation. Teenagers in love, that's what dad and mom were, right to the end. Mom passed 14 months before dad. In every which way, dad was always complimenting mom. In response, mom would usually say, oh, Bill. When he could, he always sought mom's opinion when making decisions. 68 happy, happy years together. When I was 16, Dad took me on a great trip, a great father-son trip. Uh, we toured the British Isles for two and a half weeks. Among other great sites, we visited, visited Stonehenge. At that time, the parking lot was on the other side of the two-lane road. We crossed the road to reach the ticket booth. Dad paid the admission, and we began walking. It was about a quarter mile to the site on a dirt path. I collected coins then, and of course was fascinated with English coins. So Dad handed me the change. While walking, I counted the change and figured out that the clerk had given us too much change back. I recounted. I told Dad. By that time, we were almost there. The pillars of Stonehenge were upon us. Without a word or hesitation, Dad immediately turned around with me, and we retraced our steps all the way back 
to the booth. Never did dad say, we'll catch him on the way out. Or, that's okay. We returned the extra change to a somewhat astonished and grateful clerk. We then headed back to the site. Children may not do as you say, but they watch what you do. It made an indelible impression on me. In teaching me to never lose my idealism, Dad told me what Dr. Albert Schweitzer once said, quote, the tragedy of life is what dies inside a man while he lives, end quote. It can't be stated any better. Also, never, never give up. As we trial lawyers and judges know, things happen in trial. It's a rare day when trials go completely as planned. So when I was a trial lawyer, Dad told me that when something potentially devastating happens to your case, quote, you are hit upside the head with a two by four, blood coming from your ear, end quote. And the jury turns to look at you, you remain stoic. Don't show emotion. Stay and keep fighting. As he said, sail on, sail on. Dad and I had lunch every week together. Many times as I was walking to meet him, I would be grappling with a legal issue, an evidentiary issue, a life issue. And I really felt like I was going to visit the Oracle. We would talk it through. To me, he was always right. And it was so simple. I wondered why I had been struggling at all. We would solve the problems of the world at those lunches. I always left happy and invigorated. As has been referenced, Dad possessed an irrepressible buoyancy, an unbridled optimism, an infectious positivity an encouraging spirit. When dad walked the back wall hallway as you heard at court, and when he visit visited the doctor's office, he would often be singling, singing and whistling, the mark of a happy person. We shared some of the same doctors. So once the receptionist and nurses learned that I was Judge Enright's son, they would get so excited. They loved Dad. When Lou Gehrig was diagnosed with his terminal illness, he famously said, quote, today I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of the earth, end quote. Dad felt exactly the same way about his life. A life well lived. About Dad's tender side. One night I was talking with him on the phone. It was a stormy night, thunder and lightning. Dad was concerned that our docks in Heidi would be afraid of the thunder and lightning. He told me to, quote, have Judy hold her. Dogs do not understand it, end quote. Dad encouraged me to strive to be all I could be. This not only for me, my sisters, his grandchildren, our family, but for everyone around him. He was a mentor to so many. Borrowing from the Criminal Justice Memorial to those of us who knew him. I say and I believe, while we live, so shall he. My dad is my hero. Quote, show me 
the idol of a man, and I will show you the direction of his life." End quote. Joe Ball, a legendary trial lawyer and, and dad's mentor, said that. I could not have had a better role model. He is my true inspiration. Dad, we miss you so much. Mom has met you with open arms in heaven. We love you. Thank you all. But this has been an extraordinary afternoon of celebration of a wonderful and exceptional life. And we will conclude it now uh, with prayer. Will you pray with me? Eternal God, you have shared with us the life of Bill. Before he was ours, he is yours. Uh, for all that Bill has given us to make us what we are, for that of him which lives and grows in each of us, and for his life that in your love will never end, we give you thanks. And now we offer Bill back into your arms. Comfort us in our loneliness, strengthen us in our weakness, and give us courage to face the future unafraid. Draw those of us who remain in this life closer to one another. Make us faithful to serve one another and give us to know that peace and joy, which is eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now let us join in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now to the one who is able to keep you from falling and to make you stand without blemish in the presence of God's glory and rejoicing, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, power, and authority before all time, now and forevermore. Amen.